Good morning. Welcome to church. If you're in Mount Olive today, we are happy to have you. If you're outside in the parking lot or watching online, we're happy to have you too. Uh, first, if you haven't heard already, I want to just do an announcement about the uh, CDC guidelines and North Carolina COVID updates. So uh, it's hard to believe, but I've been the pastor here for almost 10 months. So uh, I guess the return policy is up. Y'all can't return me yet. But, uh, <laughs> but, but through God's grace, we haven't had any real outbreaks in our congregation. We had a few people get COVID, but through God's grace, we really haven't had a bad outbreak. And we just appreciate and want to thank everybody for wearing masks during this time and for being just conscientious of each other, for caring about each other. So last Thursday and Friday, we had announcements from the CDC and the North Carolina governor who both lifted the mask requirements. So uh, what I did is I just discussed the situation with several deacons, including our chairman and vice chairman, and we're no longer going to be requiring masks for worship attendance. So if you want to and you're wearing a mask now, you can take it off. Um, unless your mom or dad tells you you have to keep it on, kids. I don't know. I see some of y'all's looks. I'm, you got to listen to your mom and dad there. But, uh, but if you would like to continue wearing a mask, you definitely can. Um, or if you want to treat church like a restaurant where you walk in and then you take it out, you know, and you walk in or uh, walk out and put it back on, you know, uh, you, you know it, you're just free to do whatever you want to with it. And uh, it's just no longer something that we're going to be uh, pursuing. And me personally... I can already see more of your faces. I've already heard more talking than I've heard since I first got here. It's almost like we need to see our whole faces and not just our eyebrows, right, in order to really connect with each other. But uh, I tell you what, I'm sorry y'all had to look at me for so long, but now I can see y'all too, so it really evens out. So I really appreciate that. But listen, if you have any questions or concerns about these changes, you can see myself or Joe or Mike, but, uh, but really... We're just trying to do what we think is best for our church and what's best for us going forward. So thank God we've been able to get through this time without any serious problems. So I really appreciate that. Uh, next, we did receive a thank you note from Tommy Hadley's family. They just said, thank you for the beautiful flowers, uh, for your prayers, your visits, the food, and the many acts of kindness that you've shown us during the time of Tommy's death. They can, it means more to us than we can express. Also, I have a note from John Green and his family. He would like to thank his friends from Mount Olive Baptist for their prayers and support during this time. They appreciate the Thanksgiving and worship service on May 11th, the musicians and others that were able to lift us up during this time of sorrow, honoring Donna Ruth's life and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, and may God richly bless you. Moving on to some of our announcements on the back of the bulletin here. Uh, graduation Sunday will be May 23rd, so if you have a graduate that you would like to honor, I would encourage you to let Josh know because we won't be able to honor them unless you tell them who they are. So uh, just spread that news wide and far if you don't mind, please. Uh, next, Memorial Day will, will be held outside. At this time, it is still being held outside, so if you have any questions about that, you can speak to Don or Mr. Ronnie, but... Uh, that is currently being debated whether they'll move it inside or not. But at this time, it's still going to be outside. There will be no meal afterwards, so we got to have something to look forward to next year, I guess. But at least we'll be able to uh, celebrate the life of and legacy of the folks that, that we've lost. Uh, yes, Mr. Ronnie. At this time, it definitely will be outside. Right. That morning, if weather's a problem, then it'll be inside. Right. Um, also, we're going to be having a one-day VBS. It's going to be Saturday, July 31st, so please see either Josh or Joe if you have any questions about that or if you'd like to volunteer. They're still making a, a list of volunteers. Also, I want to let you know, if Josh asks you for your shirt size and you're a VBS volunteer, we're not planning anything creepy, I promise. What uh, we're trying to do is get VBS volunteer shirts and have everybody wear them on that day so that parents or uh, people dropping off their children can just look and tell who our volunteers are. So um, this would be a good time not to lie about your size, men and women, okay? Just try and tell the truth if you can, all right? Uh, also, during the month of May, we're going to be collecting offering for the Baptist Hospital, so please be in prayer about that. There will be no Wednesday night services in June. And when Sunday school returns, which we're hoping will be sometime in the month of June, our Sunday school hour will start at 9.30 and go to 10.30 will be our worship service. 
Uh, please see Miss Christina Zachary if you'd like to take place in helping provide meals for Matt Wallace or Suzanne Jones f to provide meals for Dan and Lori Jones. Also, there will be a baby shower for Abby Lawson on May 29th from 2 to 4 in the Mount Olive Fellowship Hall. So if you'd like to participate in that, please plan accordingly. Prayer requests. Let's continue to be in prayer for the families in our congregation who have lost loved ones recently. Also continue to pray for Dan Jones and everybody in our congregation that's been affected by uh, cancer or other kinds of illnesses. Uh, we do have an update on Earl Thomas. He had uh, fallen and had some uh, bleeding on the brain and was taken to the hospital, taken to Rex, but uh, he is back home now. Uh, they think he may have suffered a light stroke. So please continue to be in prayer for his family. Also, I've listed on here Heath and Brooke Watson. Heath is a friend of mine who's a worship pastor, and he has stepped away from the church. He's been the music leader of for several years, so he's looking for a new uh, ministry opportunity. So be in prayer for him. And then also Brooke, his wife, as, uh, is dealing with skin cancer. So they kind of have two things going on at the same time. So if y'all can just remember them in, in your prayers, I would appreciate it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we live at a time and a place and a country where people have a choice whether they want to wear their mask in their service or not. That we don't live in a place where we demand what people do or we make requirements of what people do, but that we live in a country and a place where we have freedom of choice when it comes to the issue of wearing masks. And I thank you, God, that we were able to come through this year and not have any outbreaks in our congregation. I pray that your hand would continue to be with us as we make this change. Father, be with each and every one of us during this worship service. Help us to worship you through song, through, through listening to the sermon. But God, more than anything, help us to be humbled by your presence here. God, because if we're not coming before you to be changed, Lord, if we're not coming before you to learn more about ourselves and, 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 and more about you, then what's the purpose of even coming here? So we want to lay ourselves down before you, Lord Jesus. And we want to ask that your cleansing presence would be here, that you would change us, that you would renew us, that you would restore us, and you would give us hope to live another week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, welcome. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to come and join us now for our worship, our praise hymns. I don't know what I'm saying. How about that? <laughs> Maybe I should do better singing. So let's stand together and sing our praise hymns. This is my Father's world, and I sing the mighty power of God.
Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. Revelation 7, 9 to 10. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of the Lamb, clothed in white clothes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are truly thankful for everything you've done for us, Lord, and for the opportunities that we have to, for life today, Lord, and we just are so thankful for that and for the many blessings that you give us that we may not ever be thankful for or really realize, Lord. And Lord, just help us to be looking forward to that day whenever everyone from every tribe and every tongue and every nation will stand before you, Lord, and be praising you. Lord, we, we so look forward to that day when we'll be there in harmony, just worshiping and glorifying you, Lord. And Lord, just help us to be going out and give us a freshness of going out and seeking opportunities to tell others about you, to tell others about the good news that we have, Lord. Just help us to be able to bring others to Christ, Lord. And, and as we get close to this, this new the renovation being done in our building, Lord. May we use that to grow our church. Give us new people. Give us people that come to Christ, Lord. Give us a burden to go out and bring in young kids and their parents and have them come to church and become an active part of our church, Lord. We pray that so much as we get closer to this renovation. And Lord, just be with Josh. Give him the words that we need that we may go out and we may be transformed and changed, Lord. And, and be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
<laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, y'all. We're going to be in Jonah today. So Jonah chapter 1. We'll be looking at the whole book of Jonah, continuing our series on the minor prophets. We're glad to hear, I'm glad to see you here today. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. And we're going to read the first full chapter as an introduction. But we'll be jumping around a bit, so try to pay attention. Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Anai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come. Let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord! Let us not perish, for this man's life lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I remember the first time I learned about racism firsthand. I was 18 years old, and uh, I was in speech and debate in school, and I won for my district in Charlotte. So I got to go to the Nationals for speech and debate in Phoenix, Arizona. And my roommate was a black friend of mine who was in our district. Great performer, fun guy to have as your roommate. And after some of the competitions, we went to this museum. And we were just visiting this museum, and at the end, they had this gift shop. And when we got to the gift shop, my friend, he was being followed by security workers, right? And, and the security guards followed him so much and so often, and, and he got so embarrassed that he just felt like he had to leave the building. And, and when we got back to our room that night, he just sat there and cried beside me. And he just, he just asked, why are people so judgmental of, of people of different races? You know, why do they just take one person or even a group of people and try to judge a whole person or a whole people based on that little information that they have? And I sat there beside him and I apologized for the racism he experienced, but that never left me. You see, in our story today, we're going to look at Jonah's wrong, ungodly, bigoted, racist attitude in the racist missionary. See, Jonah is a book that's about our merciless nature versus God's mercy. We see God's patient love towards Assyria and our human nature of bigotry, anger, and resentment culminating in racism. God's compassion is boundless and not just limited to one group of people that is for the entire earth, even and especially for people that look differently, talk differently, and sound differently than we do. The story of Jonah is about his disobedience as he acts selfish, 
self-absorbed, and childish. First, he's selfish. God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And so Jonah does the godly thing and does exactly the opposite of what God tells him to do. In the ancient world, he goes as far away from Nineveh as he can. He flees because he has a racist attitude towards the Assyrians. And he judges an entire nation based on what their army did to Israel and what their reputation was in the ancient world. And he viewed God as Israel's God and no one else's. In fact, the reason God sends him there is the first place is because the Bible tells us that their wickedness has reached him. You could translate that as saying, God smelled it. So there's, there's wickedness and violence in this city that's so intense that, that it smells bad to God. So you might say, what stinks about the Assyrians? What smells bad about them? Well, this is evidence really in two areas. The first is their military. So the Assyrians had the most powerful military in the world at this point. Like their chariots, for instance, were so big and so powerful that they could mow down the opposing enemy's troops. They had two, three, sometimes even four people at a time that would sit in a chariot. That's how big and wide these chariots were. But also, it wasn't just their military's chariots, but they had, bron they had weapons of iron that could destroy the weapons of bronze that everybody else had. So they were stronger, tougher, and more invincible than the other armies. They didn't lose much. That's what I'm trying to say. But it wasn't just their military. It was also their leaders. Their leaders had a reputation for being vile, cruel, evil men. If somebody was talking against the king's edict, they would cut off their lips. If somebody took something that didn't belong to them or even touched it, they would chop off their hands. In fact, like some kind of ancient Skeletor or Dracula, they would stack up skeletons and skulls outside of their cities as a testament to how nasty they were. You don't mess with the Assyrians. You don't get in their way because they're violent and they're scary. In fact, the prophets in the Bible speak more against Nineveh than they do for Nineveh. Nineveh is a, a city in the Assyrian Empire. We're told that they, just by hearing the name Nineveh, would think of the long-lasting, bitter yoke of oppression against them. Nahum even jokes about it in Nahum chapter 3. It calls Nineveh a city of crime, utterly treacherous, full of violence, where killing never stops. So Jonah had a lot of reasons to be prejudiced. And God telling him to go to Nineveh would have been terrifying for him. It would have gone against his sense of self-preservation and it would fly in the face of his prejudice. So he ran in the opposite direction as fast as he could and God sends a storm to get his attention. And the storm is so intense that the people around them wonder if God sent it. So they draw straws, they cast lots to see whose fault it is. And guess whose fault it is? It comes to, to Jonah. And, and, what, and what do they say to him? What do they say to him? They say, what race are you? What country are you from? This man who's racist and fleeing from this other country because he doesn't want to give them the message of God is treated in a bit of a racist way, isn't he? Where are you from? Because this is your fault. God's trying to teach him a lesson about his racism. He says, I'm a Hebrew and I fear God and, and, and I'm trying to get away from him. In, in 1981, there was a radio broadcast that, that came actually across the country. In California, a man's car had been stolen. But it wasn't that thief that was the main source of the problem. It was what was sitting beside him. You see, the owner of that car had a barn at home. And he was getting ready to try to poison some rats. You know, Oscar, you know what I'm talking about, brother. We've dealt with our share, haven't we? He had some mice. So what he did was he got these crackers and he laced them with rat poison and he was going to lay them out for the rats. But the guy who stole his car didn't know that. Right? So if you can imagine, there was a broadcast going across the country saying, we got to get this man's attention. He's fleeing from authorities. He, he's, he's fleeing from ambulances and nurses and doctors. we got to get this guy's attention. We don't know where he is because if he eats those crackers that are sitting beside him, he's going to die. And the further he tried to get away, the more at risk he was because he couldn't get away from that deadliness because it sat right beside him. That's what happens to Jonah. The more he tries to get away, the more of a mess his life becomes. Look at the next verse here. Jonah tells the sailors and the passengers around him, if you get rid of me, everything's going to be okay. 
He's so hard-hearted, he doesn't tell them to take him to Nineveh. He would rather drown and die than go preach to these people that are a different race, a different background, a different religion than him. That is how angry and hard-hearted his attitude is. So not only is Jonah a scared, hard-hearted racist who selfishly flees from God, but he's also self-absorbed. How do we know Jonah is self-absorbed? Because God has to send a giant fish to swallow him in order to get his attention. That's why. His attitude doesn't change until he's in the belly of that whale, that beast, that sea monster. God's extreme reaction mirrors the reaction he needs in, in Jonah. He needs Jonah's attitude to completely change. Look at chapter 2. It says right here, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the depth, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounds me. All your waves and billows have passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters have closed in over me to take my life. The depth surrounded me. Weeds wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bar closed upon me forever. Yet you have brought my life from the pit, oh my God. His attitude changed a little bit, right? I bet it was distressing in there, Jonah. He says, the Lord called me out of my distress. I bet it was distressing in there. But is there something we can identify with in his hard hardness? Is there something we can identify with in his prejudice? Is there something we can identify with in his racism? Herschel Hobbes uh, once lived in a house where he shared rooms with other folks. And he would get in discussions with the other tenants in the house. And he had this one guy, he was always arguing about the faith, this atheist. And he would tell the guy again and again and again, this is, this is why I believe in God. This is why I have faith. This, this, this is why God has called me into ministry. And the other man would say, I just don't see the evidence. I don't believe it. I don't see it. And that man, that atheist man, one day got very, very ill. And Herschel decided he was going to go down the hall and check on him because he felt bad for him. And as he walked down there, he was... Leaning in, just about to knock on the door that day when he heard something from inside the room. Now, assuming that the man had a visitor, Herschel turns to walk away. But as he turns, he hears these two words just repeated over and over again. He hears this atheist, this man who rejected God say, Oh God, oh God. This man who said he didn't believe in God goes through this bad illness and all of a sudden he's open and praying to God. You see, some of us need to go through hard times for God to get our attention. As much as we like to pretend it's the opposite, some lessons we have to learn in a hard way because some of us are hard-headed. Some of us are very hard-headed if we would be honest about it. And that's what happens to Jonah. He waits until God has put him in the belly of that whale to change his attitude. And some people don't praise God until they go through a bad time. Some people don't praise God until they see how deep the valley of the shadow of death can be. Then they see that God has brought them out of the valley of the shadow of death. Now they can praise him a little bit. Now they can thank him a little bit. But Jonah's attitude adjustment is only temporary based on his circumstances. Based on his own shortcomings. Because Jonah is unable to admit his own faults. It's not something that we can identify with at all either, is it? Let me tell you some of my faults, okay? I've told you all before, I'm dyslexic and I'm ADD. And I had people in elementary school say I would never graduate high school. But I didn't really talk to you about how it affects me. And, uh, and one of the most embarrassing ways it affects me is not that, that most sentences I write, I have to write three or four times, right? And, and, and it's not that, that anything I do, I have to check several times and then show to my wife and find a way I messed up I didn't know. Uh, but the most embarrassing part of it is people's names. <laughs> and, and, and it's not something you advertise to a search committee. Sorry, Jane, but it's just not something that we advertise as, as our, our biggest, truest weaknesses that we're the most embarrassed about is I'm terrible at remembering people's names, right? And, and, and it's not because I don't care about people. I had people in my last church that I knew for years and years and years that I loved. Some people that I held their hands when they died, and I can't remember their names right, right? Some of it is I, I know their name, 
but I don't remember how to say it right. Some of it, uh, I'm dyslexic and I confuse the letters and, and what I remember their name is is different. And that's why God gave me a wife named Anna because backwards or forwards is exactly the same, right? <laughs> But listen, this is me and this is my embarrassment and that's what I deal with. So I stand there every day, every Sunday, and I come up here and I have to try to pronounce these biblical names, right? And I stand at that back door and I shake your hand and I'm, I probably remember most of your names, but a lot of times I'm just too afraid to say it because I'm afraid. Is it, is it Christina or Christine? You know, is it, uh, is, 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 is it, is it Pricker, P Pritchard or, or, or Pickard? You know, what, what, am I going to say it right? Am I going to say it wrong? And it's just, it's embarrassing. And I hate it about myself. I really do. And it's hard for me to admit that. I'm sweating up here. <laughs> um, but in the same way, we admit our own shortcomings and it's hard. We, we, none of us are going to raise our hand and say, I'm racist. Right? Now, if we were honest, we might say that we have prejudice. We might be able to admit that we are prejudiced against different people or we are prejudiced against different things. And I just want to tell you what the Bible says about our attitudes of racism and prejudice and bigotry. Romans chapter 2 verse 11 says that God shows no favoritism. Leviticus 19.34, God says, Love the foreigners in your midst as you would one of your own, for you were once foreigners. So unless anybody in here is a Native American, I think it applies to us too, okay? Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female. But we are all one in Christ Jesus. Revelation, as Josh read earlier, tells us that every nation, tribe, and tongue will be present in heaven. And if you are not comfortable with people of other races, then you're going to be uncomfortable in heaven, y'all. You need to go ahead and get your attitudes right so that you don't feel uncomfortable. Because I, I hate to tell you this, and I don't know if you've ever done the math, but the people that they're probably going to be the least of in heaven, uh, come to think of it, might be white people. There's more Chinese Christians. There's more Middle Eastern Christians. There's more African Christians than any other ethnicities in the world, aren't there? Yeah, there are, especially when you think of all time and all history. So taking this narrow view of Christianity that only takes our race into account, this is God looks like us. Listen, Jesus didn't look like us. Jesus was a Palestinian Jewish man. He would be shorter than any of us here today. And God in the Bible tells us that there was no form that we should look upon him. His Instagram would be pretty bad. Not a lot of followers there. But he lived a life that changed everyone. So Jonah understood this and then forgot about it. But, but guess what? I got to see it firsthand this week at Miss Donna's funeral. And I'm, I'm never going to forget it. I've never had an experience like this, Okay. At that funeral, we had people of different races worshiping God up here. We had a black man that played the piano. We had two African-American ladies that came up and sang songs for us. And we interspersed them. We had some white folks come and sing and play. And we had some black folks come and sing and play. And I'm telling you right now, it's one of the best worship services, much less funerals that I've ever been a part of. Because we truly worship God that way. And that's what it's going to be like in heaven. All these little divisions that we want to have between us will fade away in the light and the glory of God Almighty as we sit at His feet and worship at His throne. So Jonah temporarily comes to his senses and God has that well. Vomit him up on the side of the beach, y'all. There ain't no way to say it to make it pretty. He spits him up on the beach. And Jonah hopefully takes a shower first. I'm not sure. It doesn't say that. But maybe we can say he took a shower. And he goes to Nineveh. And he preaches in Nineveh that God's going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. And that basic term that he uses for destruction, it's the same one that means to turn away from or turn around. Uh, we can say that Jonah preached to them that they need to repent. They need to turn around. They need to turn or burn. That God will literally destroy them like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's the thing, y'all. It worked. It worked. People took it so seriously they stopped eating and stopped drinking. And not only that. They made their animals not eat or drink. That's how seriously they took this. So they stopped it and miraculously took his words seriously. Have you ever been surprised by someone accepting the gospel that you preached with or shared with or prayed with? I have. <laughs> More than one time, okay? I remember the first time I was surprised by it. I was 19 years old. I was in my freshman year of college. And one of my good friends from school came to visit me. And we were sitting at one of those Pizza Hut buffets. Y'all remember those Pizza Hut buffets, right? 
We were sitting there having one of those great Pizza Hut salads, okay? Crunching on the salad. And I was just telling him what was going on in my life, right? I wasn't trying to do anything. I, I just said, I'm reading through the Bible for the first time, really reading through it and, and, and trying to understand it. And I said, and I'm taking notes, and I feel that God's leading me somewhere. I, I didn't know God wanted me to be the pastor back then. I didn't. But, but I said, God's leading me to do something. I don't know what it is. And God's really making an impact on me. And these are all the ways that God's leading me. And this is all the evidence of, of God leading me. And my friend stops me, and he goes, I want that. And I said, you do? I did like this. All right. Are you sure? He said, yeah. I said, okay, man, let's eat our pizza first. You know, I don't want to deal with this. Right? So we ate our pizza <laughs> at Pizza Hut. And we went back to my dorm room. And, and I wanted to give him a chance to change his mind because I didn't really buy it. You know? And we got back there and he said, yes, I want to be a Christian. And, and I just led him through a prayer to God. And, and he became a Christian that day. And he, and he still is today. And I've been friends with him. I've been friends with my buddy Eric for a long time, y'all. I've been friends with him for over 26 years, and that's the most he ever surprised me was that day. You see, sometimes we can be surprised about folks coming to Jesus. And my surprise made me joyous. I couldn't believe this man, just based on my testimony of what God was doing in my life that time, wanted to be a Christian. And that's exactly how Jonah reacts, right? He goes to Nineveh and preaches this sermon, and the people take it serious, and that's the end of the book of Jonah, right? That, I mean, that's what we hear in Bible school. No one ever gives us chapter 4 in Bible school, do they? The story just ends right... And I wish I could tell you that that's the end of the story and you can go home. But the sermon ain't over yet, y'all. And the story ain't over yet. Because that's not the end of the story, is it? Because unfortunately, Jonah is not just selfish. And he's not just a self-absorbed person. But he reacts to the salvation of the people of Nineveh in a childish, childish way. So although God never gives up on Jonah, and God never gives up on the people of Nineveh, Jonah gets upset. And he's childish. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. He reacts terrible to finding out the Assyrians repented. The Bible tells us that he's ill and angry. He's so upset, he feels depressed. He's despondent over the fact that Nineveh responded. In fact, in verse 2, he says, God, that's why I ran away in the first place. I knew that you were merciful. I knew that you were going to forgive these people. These people are of the wrong race. They're of the wrong background. You don't know what they did to my ancestors. None of this is familiar, is it? No, I guess it isn't. He's pitching a fit like a toddler, isn't he? It's like taking a car from a little boy, or in my case, taking a straw from my son's hand while he's trying to shove it in your eye. But <laughs> listen, toddlers have temper tantrums when things don't go their way, don't they? And that's what Jonah does. Except it's worse than a temper tantrum. And listen, if you're a teenager in here, I'm not picking on y'all, okay? 11, 12, 13 year old. But it's worse than a, than a temper tantrum of a toddler. It's a teenage temper tantrum. Right? <laughs> right? He gets real emo all of a sudden. And what does he say to God? He says, God, this is so not fair. I want to die. And he doesn't say it once or twice, y'all. He says it over and over again. He tells them, hey, God, you forgive them of their sins and you relented from disaster. I wanted you to destroy them and you're not doing what I want you to do. It's not fair. It's not fair. This is not the way I want it to go. So Jonah gets mad and he leaves the city and he goes and he, he sits under this tree. It's real hot. There's a hot wind blowing in. Oh. And God sends a worm to show Jonah how petty he is. And that worm starts eating a hole in some of the leaves that are giving him shade. And, it, and it's just outside of his reach. He can't, he, he can't quite get it. So he just sits there and he gets more and more upset and, and more and more depressed. And he says, God, if you thought I was angry before, now I really want to die. <sighs> Funny thing is, he, he doesn't take any action. He just wants to complain. And God says, really, Jonah? Really, Jonah, you want to die? You care so much about this little plant that I made grow last night to teach you a lesson. And this leaf is less than a day old. I had that, I had that worm eat. And then he says, should I not pity Nineveh? Over 120,000 people in this city, not to mention the animals that they have. Because the animals were part of the repentance. And he says to them, 
they don't know their left from their right. He's not saying there's 120,000 children. He's saying they're ignorant. They don't know right from wrong. And I sent you to teach them and tell them right from wrong. And you're acting like a child. Should I not pity them? They are completely lost and I care about them. Did you ever know that God can call you to love on a people that are different than you? Did you ever know that God can call you to minister to people that you don't even like? One church board in the 1920s, as the, the civil rights movement was kicking off, this deacon board met together and they decided, we're going to make sure that black people can't come into our church. And we're going to have signs. He said, these people want to protest and have signs, we're going to have signs. So they stood out in front of their church and they had signs. And the sign said, we do not believe that all men are brothers. We do not believe that God the Father is your father. But if you want to talk about Jesus as your Savior, we'll talk about it in the parking lot. But you are not allowed in the congregation. So they started this. And they didn't do it for a short time, y'all. One year later, they were still doing it. And a young man who was a Bible student at the time came and wanted to become a member of this church. He just happened to be black. But this young man, I don't know why he wanted to be a member of that church, right? They must have... They must have had the best potlucks. I don't know. You know, they must have had good preaching or good music. I don't know what it was to drew this young man there. But he stood and let the whole church vote on whether or not they would let him become a member. And they said, no, you're not welcome here. And that, and that young man left and he finished Bible college. And he founded a church. And you know, that guy's still preaching. And his name's Tony Evans. And he has one of the biggest ministries, most successful ministries in the country. Their hard-heartedness made them lose out on being a part of one of the most successful ministries in America today because they were so racist and prejudiced. You see, we might not hold signs outside our churches anymore, but we still like to practice segregation. We have to ask ourselves, if people of different race come in and they try to sit in my pew, how am I going to act? We need to make sure that we're not continuing in this same tradition of prejudice and racism that many of us grew up in. You see, God's question to Jonah has resounding implications for us today. Are we more concerned with validation and support of our opinion? Are, are, are we happier when things don't change in our church, when our pew stays the same, and when everybody looks like me? Because the truth is, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in His sight, and all deserve to hear His gospel. And God... Almighty does not care what group you come from and God does not care what group you hate, but he calls us to minister and do outreach to both. There's another famous man who was very interested in Christianity and his name was Gandhi. Gandhi studied Christianity in college and he became fascinated with Jesus. And he, he thought Christianity has the answer to the problem of the caste system and the problems of racism in India. So he went to, to his local church and he said, when I get there, I'm going to ask the pastor to tell me how to become a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to ask him if he'll meet with me because I want to study under him. Gandhi got as far as the back doors of the church until the ushers stopped him. And they said, you're not welcome here. You can't come into this congregation and learn about Jesus. You need to go find some of your own people. And Gandhi left. And he never tried to enter a church again. And he said later in life that, that Christianity had the same caste system just by a different name. You see, our prejudice and our racism can impact people's eternities. Just like Jonah's racism and prejudice impacted his spiritual development, it can impact our spiritual development today. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we prejudiced and are we racist? Are we bigoted? Because Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale. And he goes to preach in a city that takes three days to cross and he is successful while he utterly fails. But one day, one day a man comes and he doesn't preach for three days, he preaches for three years. And that man at the end of that service comes and he's crucified. And he's buried. And he lives in death for three days and comes out of the well. Just as Jonah came out of the well, God comes out of the grave through Jesus Christ. And he doesn't fail, but he gets it right by dying for our sins on the cross and three days later being resurrected. So today is an opportunity for you to confess your shortcomings. 
for you to confess your prejudice, for you to confess your racist attitudes and recognize that we are all one in Christ. Number one, are you selfish in your attitudes, in your actions, in your thought life? Does it all come back to what is best for me? Or is service before self part of who you are? Are you self-absorbed? Do you try and make everything completely about you? Your family, your friends, your concerns. Is there even any room in your life for God to convict you? Can God show you that there's something wrong with what you're doing? Can God show you that there's something wrong with your thought life without you fighting back and being defensive? Are you even open? Are you tuning me out even now as I try to tell you how you can apply this message? Because I can tell now that I see your face that some of you are. Are you childish? Do you pitch a fit? Do you get mad when God doesn't do what you want him to do? Do you get mad when God doesn't act the way you want him to act? Don't be childish. Don't be focused on your own perspective and your own needs. But guess what? Approach God and ask him, can I learn from this? Let's use Jonah's bad example because that story ends with Jonah being not repentant. He's still stuck in his bad attitude as the story ends. So ask yourself, are you selfish? Are you self-absorbed? Are you childish? Are you prejudiced? Do you have racism as a part of your identity? That's okay. If you struggle with these issues, that's okay. Be honest about them for once and come down here and pray. Meet God and talk to him about this shortcoming in your own life. Or ignore it and it'll continue to be a part of your issues. And one day when you meet God face to face, you're going to be very uncomfortable when you look left and you look right. And I'd rather you not. I'd rather you be comfortable. Because most of the Christians in heaven aren't white anyway. I think the Chinese have us outnumbered already. People of Middle Eastern descent, the oldest, most famous Christians, definitely don't look like us. Let's be uncomfortable now so we can be comfortable later. Confess your sin and receive his grace. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you can show us our racism and our prejudice. God, I thank you that we are able to be real with you. God, you already know our sin. God, you already see into us the problems that we have and the ways we try to hide it. You already see the ways that we try to walk around it and, and, and not be honest about it because it's hard to be honest about our shortcomings. God, we grew up hearing the N-word. We grew up hearing people have racism sprinkled in their speech like salt and pepper on our food. God, it's such a part of our identity and our culture that it's hard for us to separate ourselves from it. But today, Lord, we come before you and we confess our racism. Today, Lord, we come before you and we confess our bigotry and our short-sightedness. God, we come before you and we lay our hearts bare. Because, God, I would rather be embarrassed on earth than embarrassed in heaven. And I would rather be uncomfortable now than uncomfortable then. So we give us, to each and every one of us, a touch of your grace. Give us, to each and every one of us, a touch of your Spirit. That we might open ourselves up to become more like you. Because God does not judge people based on the color of their skin. He does not judge people based on their background. He judged them on their witness, on their faithfulness, on their pursuit of him. Let us give thanks as we leave this time of worship and to become radically clean on the issue of racism. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.